Good evening, everyone. My name is Arjun Dhar, and on behalf of the Speaker Secretaries of the Cambridge University Law Society, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this talk on Miller Number 2, The Case of the Decade. This evening, we are very privileged to have one of the barristers in Miller Number 2, Lord Panic QC, share his thoughts on this seminal case. Before I introduce our guest, I'm going to run through the format of the event. The event will last approximately one hour. Lord Panic will speak for about 40 minutes and we'll take questions for the remainder. After the event, there'll be a drinks reception at the lower ground level of the uh, law faculty to which everyone's invited. Uh, without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker this evening. As one of the UK's most highly regarded advocates, Lord Panic is a well-known name to Tripor students. He practices at Blackstone Chambers in London in a broad range of areas with a particular emphasis on public law and human rights and constitutional law. He studied law at Hartford College, Oxford, where he graduated with a BA and BCL degree. Thereafter, he was called to the bar at Gray's Inn in 1979, taking silk in 1992. Lord Panic has acted in a large number of the leading public law cases of the last 25 years, appearing in 100 cases in front of the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, more than 20 cases in the Supreme Court since its creation in 2009, and more than 25 cases in the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. In the world of academia, Lord Panic has been a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, since 1978, and an honorary fellow of Hartford College, Oxford, since 2004. Please join me in welcoming Lord Panic. Thank you very much, Arjun, for that uh, very warm uh, welcome. In the summer of 2019, the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords, of which I am a member, conducted an inquiry into the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. And we, we asked a number of distinguished servants of the Crown what would happen if, at the end of the day, a Prime Minister acted in an unconstitutional manner. And one of them told us, our job is to make sure that we never get to the end of the day. The prorogation case, so that's how civil servants work, uh, <laughs> should work. The, the prorogation case is a very rare example uh, of uh, judicial intervention being required after the end of, of the day. Uh, as you all know, on the 24th of September last year, Lady Hale, the President of the Supreme Court, and Lord Reed, the Deputy President, uh, announced the decision of a unanimous court of 11 judges. They said that the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, had unlawfully advised Her Majesty to prorogue, that is, suspend, Parliament for five weeks. As a matter of law, said the Court, Parliament had not been uh, prorogued. When the Royal Commission had attended Parliament uh, for the prorogation ceremony on the 9th of September, uh, it was, I quote, as if the Commissioners had walked into Parliament with a blank piece of paper, uh, unquote. The next day, uh, Parliament resumed, and the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burkow, announced that he had directed that the Journal of Parliamentary Proceedings for the 9th of September in relation to prorogation be expunged, his word, very John Burkow uh, words, great word. It should be expunged, the record, and replaced by a new entry recording that the House had simply been adjourned. Uh, it was the parliamentary equivalent of the episode in the 1980s television series Dallas, which almost <laughs> all of you are far too young to remember, which revealed that the previous series in which Bobby Ewing uh, had died was just a bad dream. I want to mention some aspects of the background to this remarkable case and some of its constitutional uh, implications. Uh, I, of course, declare my interest as counsel for uh, one of the claimants, uh, Mrs. Miller. 
Now, you all know prorogation is the term that's used to describe the end of a parliamentary session brought about other than by the dissolution of, of parliament leading to a general election. And the purpose of prorogation uh, is simply to allow for arrangements to be made for a Queen's speech that starts a new session of parliament setting out the government's legislative programme. This normally happens on a yearly basis. And during prorogation, parliament does not meet. Uh, legislation can't be considered by either house. There are no debates. Uh, you can't ask parliamentary questions of ministers. And committees can't carry out their normal work of uh, conducting inquiries, uh, publishing uh, reports. And all of this suspension of parliamentary activity is normally very unimportant. It's insignificant because it is temporary. Uh, as stated in a House of Commons library paper, in the last 40 years, I'm quoting, in the last 40 years, Parliament has never been prorogued for longer than three weeks. In most cases, it's been prorogued for only a week or less. On this occasion, the prorogation was for an exceptionally long period of time, uh, some five weeks, uh, from the 9th of September until the 14th of October. And the length of the prorogation was of special significance uh, because the effect of the European Union Withdrawal Act, as amended, uh, was, that part that was that the United Kingdom uh, was going to leave the EU, you will remember, on the 31st of October, unless an extension was agreed. So this prorogation for five weeks meant that Parliament was going to be closed for 34 of the 52 calendar days prior to the 1st of November. And that would have resulted in the loss of 19 ordinary sitting days for Parliament, assuming that Parliament wasn't going to sit, and it normally doesn't, on a Friday or at the weekends. And those were days when Parliament could have debated the highly contentious issues of uh, the terms on which we should be leaving the EU, and indeed at that stage, uh, the issue of whether there should have been a further referendum. Now, on the Wednesday, 28th of August, uh, I was on a safari holiday with my uh, family in Botswana looking at wild animals. And uh, a text message uh, came through that the wild animals in uh, Westminster had decided <laughs> to uh, prorogue uh, Parliament for five weeks. Uh, we, that's uh, the other council, <coughs> with whom I was working and the solicitors were already well advanced to bring a challenge to a prorogation because you may remember in July last year, uh, after winning the Conservative Party leadership uh, election, Boris Johnson had expressly refused to rule out prorogation as a means to help ensure that this country left the uh, EU. Uh, and um, uh, we've been advising and we've been preparing proceedings on the basis that the prorogation would begin before and end after the 31st of October uh, in order to ensure that Brexit was accomplished on the 31st of October. That's what we feared the Prime Minister was going to do. Parliament would simply not be sitting in the few days leading up uh, to a few weeks leading up to Brexit Day. Um, and what was announced was much more subtle than that. It allowed for Parliament to resume sitting uh, two and a half weeks before Exit Day on the 31st of October. But the documents were ready, and so we were able to start proceedings in the High Court the next day, on Thursday the 29th of August, uh, challenging the legality of what the Prime Minister had done. Uh, I arrived back uh, from Botswana at Heathrow Airport early on Monday, the 2nd of September. Uh, I went straight into chambers to prepare the case in the divisional court, and we were in court that Thursday, the 5th of September. And um, uh, it didn't go very well. I began the proceedings by 
mentioning <coughs> that it was the first case that my uh, very junior junior, Warren Fitz, had ever been involved in. And I told him that he shouldn't expect that every one of his cases would be before the Lord Chief Justice, the Master of the Rolls, and the um, uh, President of the Queen's Bench Division. And um, that got a laugh, but unfortunately, so did the rest of my uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because the Divisional Court announced the next day, on the Friday, that the Prime Minister's advice to uh, Her Majesty was a political matter, uh, to which legal standards simply could not be applied. That was the ruling, and the critics of the Supreme Court judgment have essentially echoed uh, that finding, and I'll come back to that. Um, the case was always going to go to the Supreme Court, and before it did, it was heard in the Supreme Court two weeks later, the 17th to the 19th of September. Uh, before it did, we had the enormous boost of the decision by the inner house of the Court of Session in Scotland in very similar proceedings brought by Joanna Cherry, the uh, SNP uh, MP. And the Scottish Court found uh, they heard some high octane advocacy from uh, Hayden O'Neill. Uh, they found that the Prime Minister's advice was unlawful because it was motivated, this is what the Scottish Court found, it was motivated by the Prime Minister's fear that Parliament would simply undermine his negotiating position with the uh, EU. Well, it was, uh, and, and Aidan O'Neill, I don't know if any of you saw it in the proceedings, he, he, his advocacy in the Supreme Court was also very high octane. Uh, the issue, as I've indicated, was whether this was a political issue or, or, or a legal matter. And he began his submissions by referring to the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, <laughs> Oliver Cromwell, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, and Nelson Mandela. <laughs> and he told the Supreme Court that the Prime Minister uh, was the father of lies, seeking to, <laughs> seeking to close down the mother of Parliament. <laughs> I, I, I was less high up there in, in my, my, my submissions. I mean, it was clear from the start of the hearing in the Supreme Court that the justices were concerned about whether it was consistent with basic principles of our constitutional law for the Prime Minister to prevent scrutiny by Parliament um, of uh, his decisions on very important uh, issue for five of the seven and a half weeks prior to Brexit Day without any explanation being given to the court as to why uh, a prorogation of that length was uh, required. And the Supreme Court was, I think, understandably, much more interested in the effect of prorogation than the motives of the Prime Minister, which, as I've said, is what concerned the uh, Scottish Court. The government's case was severely handicapped by the Prime Minister's failure to file a witness statement either by himself or by the cabinet secretary explaining why a five-week prorogation uh, was uh, needed. Uh, there were very strong rumours that senior civil servants had refused to sign draft witness statements that told only, as they saw it, part of the story. Uh, but we had no evidence to that effect and the court was simply faced with, with no uh, witness statement other than the Treasury Solicitor's witness statement, which exhibited some uh, documents. One of those documents uh, that was revealed was very damaging. It was a memo in the Prime Minister's own handwriting uh, saying to his advisers, there was no need for concern that Parliament would not be sitting in September, as such a sitting was, quote, a rigmarole introduced by a, quote, girly swat, unquote, uh, that's David Cameron, to show the public that MPs were earning uh, their crust. Uh, well, the powerful judgment, I think it is a powerful judgment, of Lady Hale and Lord Reed um, for a unanimous Supreme Court of 11 uh, ensured the transformation of this case from what many observers have dismissed as at best a speculative legal argument to what is now widely, although not universally, uh, regarded as a plain uh, and obvious uh, conclusion. Now, Boris Johnson uh, went on television 
that Sunday, Sunday the 29th of September, just after the uh, judgment. And he told Andrew Marr on the BBC One that the Supreme Court decision was, quote, novel and peculiar, uh, unquote. Now, I don't know about peculiar, but in one sense, this was new law. Um, uh, critics of the judgment are undoubtedly right to say that there is no previous case in which our courts have held that prior ministerial advice to the Queen on the prorogation of Parliament was unlawful. There's no previous case. Uh, but there is a very good reason uh, for that. Prior to this episode, no prime minister in this country had so abused his or her powers in this respect that the courts have been asked to intervene, at least in the period uh, since the 1970s when modern principles of judicial review have been applied. In this country, prorogation, as I've said, uh, in the last 50 years or so, has always been an uncontroversial matter. However, this is not new law, as I see it, in that the relevant legal principles are very well established. Uh, the power to prorogue Parliament is a prerogative power. That is, it's a power not set out in statute, although Section 6 of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act 2011 does refer to uh, the existence of this uh, power. But it's been the law uh, since the decision by Chief Justice Cook in 1611 that, a quote, the king, now the executive, hath no prerogative but that which the law allows him, unquote. In other words, it's for the courts to decide on the scope of prerogative powers. There's nothing novel about that. There are many cases in the 20th century where courts have uh, assessed the legality of exercises of prerogative powers. And when courts do, ex do assess the legality of the exercise of prerogative powers, they apply the standard principles of judicial review that have been developed and repeatedly restated over the past 50 years. A power may only be exercised by assessing relevant factors. It may only be exercised for a proper purpose in a reasonable manner. And if there's any doubt about that, the court will look to see whether the proponent <coughs> of the power has given a reason uh, for exercising the power at all or, or, or in that way. Uh, and the courts were applying a further well-established legal principle, the principle of our constitutional law, like all principles of our constitutional law, unwritten, but nonetheless a principle. And the principle is that Parliament is sovereign and the executive, led by the Prime Minister, is answerable to uh, Parliament. And therefore, as the Supreme Court accepted, the court has a special responsibility to prevent any abuse of uh, the prerogative power, the power to, per to um, prorogue uh, Parliament, especially uh, if the abuse is said to come from a government whose prorogation of Parliament has the effect of impeding the ability of Parliament to supervise the actions of the executive. So these principles, I think, created a very strong legal basis for a judgment that the executive could not use its prerogative power to silence Parliament uh, during an important period of time, and certainly without the executive stating a reason, a good reason, uh, for doing so. Uh, and as I've indicated, the Prime Minister advanced no coherent reason for wanting a five-week prorogation. So I do not agree, won't surprise me, no, I don't agree with critics of the judgment who say that the Miller case is an example of, I quote, the judicialization of politics 
and the politicization of the judicial process. That's the charge made by Professor Richard Eakins, who's a professor at law, of law at a very serious university, Oxford University, <laughs> and he's head of policy exchanges, judicial power project. And that's what he told the House of Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee on the 8th of October last year. This was the judicialization of politics and the politicization of the judicial process. Very serious uh, allegations. And I, I don't agree with that. I think, and I'd be interested to hear your views in a few moments, I think this was an example of judges performing their constitutional role to remedy what they saw as an abuse of power. Uh, it was the court saying to the government, uh, you have exercised a power, very important power, in a manner which has a very damaging effect on parliamentary sovereignty, which is one of the core principles of our constitution. Uh, you've done this at a crucial time, and you are unable to articulate the reason for requiring such a lengthy suspension of parliament. I was very pleased to see that the judgment of the court was welcomed as a conventional application of well-established constitutional norms by Lord Sumption, who, you know, is recently retired uh, from the Supreme Court and a formidable critic in his Reef lectures of what he has regarded uh, as the judiciary's eagerness, in some cases, to intrude into political issues. So he's not shy of saying that the judges intrude into what should remain political issues. Uh, but not in this case. Lord Sumption's response to the Miller judgment was to say, in his evidence to the same committee that heard from Professor Eakins, that he, Lord Sumption, thought that there is an important difference between the courts intervening in relation to a question of policy and, I quote, the court simply saying, as they've done in their recent decision, that this is a matter on which Parliament must be enabled to make decisions. So he, Lord Sumption, thought this wasn't a challenge by the courts to any parliamentary decision. It was a challenge by the courts to a decision of the executive to prevent Parliament from sitting. And he thought, in assumption, that that was entirely uh, appropriate. Uh, nor do I agree with, with the critics who've said that, um, uh, that the courts gave the game away in paragraph one of the judgment when it said this case was a one-off. Um, what the court did uh, was uh, not, as has been alleged, uh, uh, recognised that it was unable to lay down standards by reference to which the legality of prorogations could be uh, assessed. Uh, what the court was saying is that when it applies the public law standards, reasonableness, proper purpose, matters of that sort, um, the court recognises that the decision maker, here the Prime Minister, has uh, a discretionary margin of judgment. Uh, and the court does not sit on appeal to remake the decision as it seems fit. The task of the court is simply to say whether the decision is so far removed from what is permissible uh, that it is uh, unlawful. And it's not the task of the court to define the boundary between what is permissible and what is impermissible. This was part of the uh, the, uh, the government's legal argument. You can't say where the boundary lies. You can't say precisely what is, how long a prorogation is permissible. That's not the court's task. The judge's function is to decide whether this exercise of power, that is a five-week prorogation in these circumstances, is on the right side of the line or the wrong side of the line. Uh, two further points I, I want to mention. Uh, the first is to go back to Lord Sumption, because he made another point in his evidence 
uh, was on the 8th of October to the House of Commons Public <coughs> Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. And he, Lord Sumption, said that if instead of giving no reason to the Supreme Court for wanting a five-week prorogation, if the government had boldly told the Supreme Court in a witness statement that the reason for proroguing Parliament for five weeks was to prevent what the government, the Prime Minister, regarded as parliamentary interference in the government's negotiations for Brexit with our European partners at a crucial time, then, says Lord Sumption, the court could not have intervened because then it would inevitably have been deciding on the strength of a political justification. So Lord Sumption's point is that the government should have come clean. And if they'd said this is politics and we don't wish to disguise it, <coughs> that's what we're doing, then the court would not have intervened. <coughs> that's a very interesting point. I take a different view. If that's what the government had said, I think at least a majority of the judges would have responded that whether or not this was justified in political terms, which is not a matter for the court, of course, it was still unlawful because the government would have been admitting closing down Parliament in order to avoid parliamentary scrutiny. And that would be a motive inconsistent with the parliamentary sovereignty, which is at the heart of our constitution. But that would have been a more difficult case. The government made it easy for us, um, but I think we still would have won. The other matter, <laughs> the other matter I want to mention is the role of the Queen, which is also very interesting. Um, Her Majesty formally approved the prorogation, acting on advice from the Prime Minister. And we had evidence in the case in the form of the transcript of an interview on the BBC Radio 4 Today programme <coughs> on the 29th of August. That was the day after the prorogation. And it was an interview with Mr Jacob rees mogg And he uh, uh, was, still is, the Lord President of the Privy Council, and he was one of the Privy Councillors who had had a day out attending Her Majesty uh, at Bar Balmoral when she gave her approval uh, to the prorogation. And on this radio interview, he told the interviewer, John Humphreys, that it was, quote, a prime ministerial decision. It's not a decision of the sovereign. Uh, and that was the evidence before the court. There was no evidence that Her Majesty was advised or saw herself as having any independent decision-making role in this matter. She wasn't asked, do you agree? Uh, and she didn't exercise any independent judgment. And my submission for Gina Miller was that this was correct as a matter of constitutional law. Her Majesty has no discretion to reject the Prime Minister's advice on uh, prorogation. The argument for the Prime Minister in the Miller case was more nuanced. Uh, the argument was that in this case, Her Majesty did not take any independent decision. She simply followed what she was advised to do. But, said counsel for uh, the Prime Minister, Sir James Eady, uh, um, he wanted to adopt a neutral position on whether Her Majesty could have uh, exercised an independent judgment and said to the Prime Minister, well, you say that, but uh, I don't uh, agree. Now, this is a very interesting and difficult issue of principle. Prior to the abolition uh, by the Fixed Term Parliaments Act of the Queen's prerogative power to dissolve Parliament so that a general election can take place, there was much authority suggesting that Her Majesty is not obliged, was not obliged, to follow the advice of the Prime Minister on that topic, that is dissolving Parliament, so there can be a general election. 
but that Her Majesty has a personal prerogative. It's up to her. She can say no. And in Commonwealth countries, which follow the Westminster model of government, there are examples. Uh, they're discussed in a comprehensive study by Professor Anne Twomey at the University of Sydney. There are examples of the representatives of heads of state in the Commonwealth deciding, and not just following prime ministerial advice, on whether to prorogue Parliament. And the most notable example is in 2008 in, in Canada, where the Governor-General, Michel Jean, was asked to prorogue Parliament by the Prime Minister, uh, and um, uh, she took the view, the Governor-General, that she did have power to refuse that request. She decided, in fact, to accept the advice, but she made it very clear it was up to her, not to the uh, Prime Minister. Now, the scope of Her Majesty's powers is important because one of the arguments that uh, we deployed for Gina Miller was that if there are no legal controls on the powers of parole, if this is just a political matter, uh, as the Divisional Court uh, held, then uh, Prime Ministers have enormous powers. Boris Johnson could have advised the Queen on the 25th of August to prorogue Parliament until the 1st of November, just to get Brexit uh, uh, done. And a future Prime Minister, uh, more interested in the views of the people uh, than the views of representatives in Westminster, could advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament for six months. Uh, or for a year, if he or she thinks that Parliament doesn't pro provide any useful uh, purpose. And the answer given to that criticism, the Prime Minister would have enormous power, uh, is that in extremists, Her Majesty would step in. She'd have a reserve power to say no to the Prime Minister's advice on prorogation. And so the issue of constitutional law and constitutional principle, which didn't arise in the middle of time, but the really interesting question of constitutional law is does Her Majesty have a reserve power uh, to say no? Uh, now, I find that really unconvincing as a principle of constitutional law. A modern constitutional democracy, in my view, cannot depend for protection of its basic norms against abuse by the Prime Minister on the opinions of Elizabeth Windsor. What principles is she to apply? Who does she consult? Does she give a reasoned uh, a judgment? And indeed, if Her Majesty were to be the constitutional backstop, the safeguard against prime ministerial abuse, then whatever decision Her Majesty would take in such a situation, had she been asked by Boris Johnson on the 1st of September to prorogue Parliament <coughs> until the 1st of November to get Brexit done, any decision that Her Majesty took in such a context would damage, perhaps irreparably, the neutrality which is so essential to the maintenance of uh, monarchy. So I think fundamental questions of constitutional law are for the courts which hear arguments in public, they give reasoned judgments by reference to precedents and to principle. You may or may not agree with what the court says, but that's a proper, transparent, uh, principle <coughs> uh, process. Uh, and it's not, I think, for, for, for constitutional law to rely on the Queen. Uh, and one impact of the Miller judgment is that in future, I'm absolutely sure that if anyone suggests that the Crown should exercise its own judgment, uh, the, certainly this monarch, maybe a, 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 another monarch in years to come may take a different view, but this monarch would be able to say, and would undoubtedly say, it's not for me to step in, uh, the courts are prepared to step in in appropriate circumstances. Not to say that the Crown has no useful role to perform, uh, just over 150 years ago, Walter Badgett, uh, in the English Constitution, gave his celebrated description of the sovereign powers. He or she has the right to be consulted, the right to encourage, and the right to warn. Those are the three powers of the sovereign. 
and a prime minister who's thinking of uh, proroguing parliament for an exceptionally long period would be well advised to consult the sovereign, particularly the present sovereign given her wealth of experience. And Her Majesty would be well within her powers to warn. And if, despite a warning, uh, the Prime Minister decided to act in a manner that may be thought to be unconstitutional, it's then for the courts, I think, not the Crown, to determine the limits of the Prime Minister's powers. So uh, the message I want to get across to you is I think the prorogation case, the Miller number two case, the case of the decade, it's last decade, not this decade, <laughs> the prorogation case was both an orthodox application of basic principles of our constitutional law, but it was also a remarkable assertion of judicial independence to protect our constitution from an unprecedented, at least in modern times, uh, abuse of prime ministerial power. And we all know that it stunned this prime minister who is threatening uh, to uh, take steps, we don't know what they are. Uh, I shall do such things what they are, I know not, to quote King Lear. He's, he's, he's threatening to do something to rein in uh, uh, the uh, courts. Uh, Walter Badger, who I just mentioned, began his study of the Constitution by noting an observation of John Stuart Mill that, quote, on all great subjects, much remains to be said. And Badger added that of no subject is this more true than of the English Constitution. And I look forward to hearing your contributions, your views on this fascinating subject. Thank you for listening.